Now, one of the first hints that there might be a connection between what you eat and your behavior was by uh, Dr. George Gould back in 1910. So we see this is not completely new. And then we see in 1935, it was found that hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, could mimic many of the serious neurological and psychological conditions like anxiety, neurosis, hysteria, neurasthenia, and even psychosis could be imitated by people becoming hypoglycemic. And then in 1973, Dr. Wendell and B found that there was a 74% incidence of hypoglycemia in people who had schizophrenia, the type of schizophrenia associated with anxiety. In other words, a very hyperactive schizophrenic. Almost three quarters of them, or three quarters of them, were uh, hypoglycemic. And we'll see what that does. And we're seeing a strong connection between sugar metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism in the brain, and various psychological conditions. For instance, they found 60% of the members of families that have hyperactive children either have diabetes, obesity, alcoholism, all three, which are all sugar consumption problems. So there's a very strong correlation there in hyperactivity in children. More research indicated that 75% of all prisoners were hyperactive as children. So it's taking it back all the way to this childhood that was programming that child for criminal behavior later in their life. Now, why would sugar have such a profound influence on brain function and psychological function? Well, when the sugar is in excess, it produces excess release of insulin. When insulin is released, you get hypoglycemia if it's excessive. That is, the blood sugar falls. When the blood sugar falls, it does two things. One, your body is trying to get that blood sugar back up because it needs that sugar for its energy metabolism. So it stimulates the adrenal gland to release two hormones. These are called epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are the hormones that make you jittery and nervous when your blood sugar falls. So it, these hormones are stimulating the brain to increase activity. Also, when the brain becomes hypoglycemic, it releases one of its neurotransmitters called glutamate. Glutamate is the primary neurotransmitter for excitability. So it is the primary thing that turns the brain's activity into high gear. So both of these, the norepinephrine, epinephrine, and glutamate, are producing a state of hyperactivity. Now let's look at the effect of crime and nutrition. Uh, this was done by Dr. Stitt, who did, was a probation officer in uh, Ohio, who did some uh, research on the effect of uh, diet and uh, probation violators. And what she found is that those who remained on a bad diet, a lot of sugar, a lot of junk food, a lot of food additives like MSG, NutraSweet, these things, when they stayed on that, 56% of them ended up violating their probation uh, by committing some antisocial act, robbery, violence, etc. But if they were switched to a healthy diet, only 8% ever broke their probation. So there was a tremendous change in their behavior just by changing their diet. And these are, are felons. When they looked at narcotic abuse, they found the same thing. is that those who maintain the bad diet, the high sugar diet, junk food diet, 47% of them continued to use narcotics while they were on probation. Whereas those who were switched to the better diet, only 13% of them violated their probation by using narcotics. So it's a rather profound effect. It's not a minor effect. They also coincidentally found there was a dramatic reduction in suicides. So there was a strong correlation between this high sugar, high junk food diet and suicidal behavior. Now the Alabama prison system also did the similar study. They changed the diet of some of the prisoners and used the others to control. They found that there was a 42% reduction in criminal events when they changed these criminals' diets and that there was a 61% reduction in antisocial behavior at one year. Another example of the profound effect of diet. Now just to give you a personal case, this is Raymond. Uh, Raymond was arrested for uh, assaulting his girlfriend. He actually tried to kill her. Uh, they were just arguing over something that was non 
uh, consequences, just, just silly. But he flew into a rage, pulled his 357 Magnum, grabbed her, put it up to her head to shoot her, and she knocked it out of the way with her hand and he shot through her hand. Uh, she wouldn't file charges against him, but the state charged him with firing a, a, a weapon inside the city limits, so they arrested him. Well, uh, Dr. Stitt went back and looked at his history, and what she found out is that age four, his mother said he had these weak spells when he was playing, and he gets so weak he couldn't hardly play any longer. She'd give him a little sugar, and then he would get back into his full activity and be fine until his blood sugar fell again, and it, it kept repeating. At age 13, she noticed there was radical mood swings and that his grades were beginning to fail, and he would have violent outbursts. This was coincident with his falling blood sugar. And at age 23, he attempts murder on his girlfriend. So she took him while he was on parole and put him on a special diet. His diet before consisted of junk foods, donuts, pastry, candy, and coffee, which is a lot of people's diet, particularly young people. And what they found is when they took him off all of this and put him on healthy food, he never broke his parole again, and he didn't commit any more violent acts. He was a changed person. And everybody remarked how they just couldn't believe it was the same person. <coughs> study a prison system in five different states, and they looked at adult felons, and they looked for deficiencies in a lot of different nutrients, but mainly magnesium, zinc, folate, and vitamin B6. What they found in all five states was that violent offenders had the most deficiencies of all the prisoners. The more violent, the more deficiencies. So it's not just hypoglycemia. Oklahoma Children's Center did a similar study, and they found there was a 43% reduction in uh, serious crime when they changed the diet. They got rid of the high-fat, high-sugar diet and junk food that these childhood offenders were on. When they wanted to objectify it and say, well, is there any objective evidence of change in brain function, they look at EEG function in, in felons. Uh, these are serious criminals. And what they found is that there were about 14 different abnormalities in their EEG. When they switched their diet, it went from 14 to 2 abnormalities. So the EEG improved considerably, and one child uh, went from 6 to 0 abnormalities with giving a simple vitamin. And they found that even marginal deficiencies in nutrition could cause criminal behavior to surface in these susceptible individuals, which are pretty high numbers. 